So picking up on the last, one of the last things that the group mentioned was the idea that uh, Leibniz had good relations with Sophie, who was sister of Princess Elizabeth, who is the first reading that I want to talk about today. This is leftover business from what we, I hope to have done last week. This is the first reading out of this book. Um, let me give you a quick overview of Princess Elizabeth. Um, she was born to King Frederick and Queen Elizabeth of Bohemia in 1618. Every little girl's dream to be a princess, right? And she was the third out of 13 children. So Sophie was just one out of many siblings. And two years after her birth, her parents lose the throne. So after being born a princess, you become more or less, well, not really a commoner, but she has no throne to inherit. So her family leaves Bohemia and lives in exile in the Netherlands. Um, we don't know a lot about, really don't know anything about how she got educated. But she must have got a pretty darn good education. She knows languages like Greek, Latin, French, English, German, and possibly others. Her siblings referred to her at times as La Grec, meaning the Greek, because she was so into studying Greek. So she wasn't, it wasn't like she just studied some of these languages in passing. She really had a passion for some of these. Um, her back, what we get from her writings and other things she's produced is she was, in, she was educated in painting, music, dancing, logic, mathematics, politics, philosophy, science. She's really super smart. Now, she never married, um, and that's largely because she was of what happened in, in 1620. That she has um, this noble upbringing, and her associations are all with people who come from the upper classes. However, um, she doesn't have any status or any... Um, inheritance to, to bring with her. So, she never marries. She ends up joining a Lutheran convent later in life, and she becomes the abbess of the convent, the head honcho, to put it. So, um, interesting details about her life there. Um, philosophically, her main her main philosophy, views and philosophy are known through her correspondence with Descartes. It includes things like the mind-body problem, which is what we're talking about, mathematics, pol political philosophy, moral philosophy. Um, interestingly, she did not give her consent to have this published. Obviously, somebody didn't listen to her because we've got it today. Um, Descartes published, so her relationship with Descartes, the reason I have this here, her relationship with Descartes is not just a passing and cursory one. They had some real friendship here. Um, he dedicated his principles of philosophy to her, and then the last book he wrote, Passions of the Soul, was written because she asked him to write it. So, and by the way, Descartes died in 1650, so um, happens right at the end of his life. Um, What we are going to be reading about is some of the issues that have to do with Descartes' substance dualism. If you remember at the end of Meditation 6, Descartes brings up this argument that says the mind cannot be identical to the body. If the mind were the same thing as the body, then you couldn't conceive them as being apart. They would necessarily be one and the same thing. However, uh, the essence of the mind is to think, the essence of the body is to be extended, so we can actually conceive of the two being apart. Um, furthermore, part of Descartes' philosophy is that these two su to these, the mind and the body are two separate substances, but they causally interact with one another. That's the background. Um, any questions about any of this before I cruise along here? So let's pull out our little books. Um, and let's take a look at a passage here. The, the background of this is um, she's writing, asking Descartes about 
the problem of how about the mind and the body. How does one interact with the other? Um, so I want to read a portion of this that spans pages 11 and 12, and I want you to um, I want you to look at this question or think about this as we read. What are the two features that she brings out that are required for causation? Um, so I'm going to start four lines down from that second paragraph. She says, I beseech you, tell me how the soul of man, since it is but a thinking substance, can determine the spirits of the body to produce voluntary actions. For it seems every determination of movement happens from an impulsion of the thing moved, according to the manner in which it is pushed by that which moves it or else depends on the qualification and figure of the superficies of the latter. Contact is required for the first two and extension for the third. You entirely exclude extension from your notion of the soul and contact seems to me incompatible with an immaterial thing. That is why I ask of you a definition of the soul more particular than in your metaphysic. That is to say, for a definition of the substance separate from its action. Thought. Alright. So what do you get from this? What is she trying to say you need to have for there to be causation between two things? Contact. Contact is one of them. And the other? Yes. Extension. Yeah. Um, so, here's the thing. When you think about causation, like one thing causing another thing, we tend to think that something like this needs to take place. If you think about it, there's a sense in which this desk is causing my book not to fall to the ground. Why is that? Because the book is making contact with the surface of the desk. Um, there's a if it didn't, and extension kind of plays into this as well, if there wasn't some kind of extended quality about this, then how is it possible for one thing to sort of touch another thing? It's almost like we're saying, in order for there to be causation, there needs to be some way for there to be touching. All right, so what's the deal here? Descartes says that the soul causes things to happen in the body, and vice versa, but the soul is not extended. The soul has no extension to it. It has no, and the question then is, how can something without extension make contact with something that is, um, with, with, how can it interact with something else? Um, maybe an easy way to bring this out is to think about people who believe in ghosts. Sometimes uh, you see on, on some depraved cable channels, people who are like ghost hunters <laughs> or, you know, uh, paranormal TV shows, these sorts of things. Some people think that these there's no no point at all in even thinking about whether these things are real. Like, how would a ghost? Here's the way this works. How would a ghost, let's say, cause something to happen? Sometimes people are like, you know, the door just opened on its own. <laughs> well, if a ghost is not a material thing, right? Ghosts are not made out of any matter. How does something that is not made out of matter cause something that is made out of matter to open? Does it? Pr how does it press up against the door and turn the knob? Like, does it, you know, if it's not made out of matter, if it doesn't have any kind of extended qualities to it, how does it make that contact? Um, if a ghost were to try to lift up my book, how could it make contact with the surface of the book and lift it up off the desk? You need to have some kind of extended quality or contact in order to m move my book around. So, the problem is that the mind does not have the features that we need to have for there to be um, causal interaction. And so this raises the general problem, which is how does the mind cause anything to happen in the body and vice versa? So Descartes tries to respond to Elizabeth by pointing out that there are these three primitive notions. These show up on page 13. Uh, if you 
Look over to there. It's the second full paragraph on the page. It says, Firstly, I consider that in us are certain primitive notions that are like originals on whose model we form all other knowledge. And there are but very few such notions, for after the most general ones of being, number, duration, etc., which refer to everything we can conceive, we have as regards body in particular only the notion of extension, from which follow those of figure and movement. And as regards the soul alone, we have that only that of thought, in which are comprised the perceptions of the understanding and the inclinations of the will. Finally, for the soul and body together, we have only that of their union, on which depends that of the force of the soul for moving the body, and of the body for acting upon the soul, by causing its feelings and passions. So Descartes is saying, we need to think that there are these three basic notions, and out of these three notions, we get all, everything else. So to call these primitive or basic means that they're like underived or that they are s simple in the sense that they're not composed of any other notions. He says one of these is the notion that the body is extended. That you don't get out of anything more basic, like that's just a starting point to understanding what bodies are. Secondly, that the mind is a thinking thing. So once again, this is a, a, a basic idea. You can't derive any other, you can't derive it from any other ideas. It's where you begin to understand the mind. And then he introduces a third basic kind of notion. And this is supposed to be something that is different from the other two in every way. It's a, a, a distinct, basic notion that the, of union. Union between mind and body. Alright, so the, before we read this, you should be thinking what I'm thinking, which is like, okay, so how does this solve any problems here? Let's keep reading and see how Descartes wants to use this idea that there are three fundamentally distinct notions. Um, so let me start four lines from the bottom on page 13. It says, um, and he says that occurs. When he says that occurs, he's referring to making a mistake about how to understand the relationship to mind and body. That occurs whenever we wish to explain one of these notions by another. For, since they are primitive, each of them cannot be understood except through itself. And inasmuch as the use of the senses has rendered the notions of extension, figures, and movements very much more similar to us than the others, the principal cause of our error consists in that we ordinarily wish to employ them to explain things to which they do not pertain. As when one wishes to employ the imagination to conceive the nature of the soul, or else one wishes to conceive the manner in which the soul moves the body after the fashion in which a body is moved by another body. This is what I think he's trying to say here, is that to, she's making a mistake in trying to think of causation between mind and body on the same model as causation between body and body. Um, so, her, the way that she's asking the question presupposes that the notions you use for body-to-body -body causation would be the same thing that you use between mind and body causation. So when I'm like, hey, how can a ghost lift my book off the table? How would a ghost make contact with that? The very way that I even ask the question just assumes the only way that to causally interact is in a body-to-body -body kind of way. So Descartes says, you have to remember that the body is one kind of notion, the soul is another kind of notion. They're not the same thing. So, what we should be thinking about is not the way that bodies interact with each other, but we need to think about the way mind and body interact with one another, in a way that is not trying to explain mind and body causation through some other notions. For instance, trying to understand mind and body causation using the same notions we just used for bodies alone. Um, so he's essentially saying 
that she has kind of framed the question in a way that just sets it up to look like there's a bigger problem than there really is. Any questions about this? So, there's one other thing in Dave, this part of Descartes' letter I want to look at. Um, he gives this analogy of weight. I'm not going to read the passage. You can look back at this if you'd like. Um, and what he's saying here is that weight is not a real feature that exists inside bodies, but it is something that we think is united with bodies, or we're led to believe that. So if you're not really careful about distinguishing certain ideas and principles and qualities, it's real easy to think that weight is something that is inside a body. But it's not really inside a body. If you think about this, um, when you have like a massive cinder block and it feels heavy, there's not something that is like the quality of weight or heaviness that, is, that exists inside the cinder block. The cinder block is just composed of a certain you know, mass. It feels heavy because of its relation to the earth, the earth, gravitational attraction. But if you took that same body and you take it into outer space, the body still ha has its features, but it no longer has the weight. We get confused sometimes if we're not careful and we, we're likely to try to ascribe things, properties from one thing that don't belong to it because of maybe sloppy or quick reasoning. Maybe what he's saying here when he tells her that what she's, she is doing is abusing what has been given us for conceiving of the manner in which the soul moves the body. That it's wrong to try to make mind and body causation fit the model of body to body causation. It's a completely unique and different kind of relation altogether. So I think um, what, sh what he's trying to tell her is that when we have these three primitive notions, that we can understand, you, it's, you shouldn't model mind and body causation off of the notion of body to body causation. You could have explored the idea that you shouldn't model it on soul to soul or mind to mind causation. There's just a whole unique category of another kind of relationship that is not analyzable or understood in terms of the other two, and that's mind and body union. All right, so Elizabeth, getting the letter, responds this way, um, that she doesn't, she, she's still not really clear on how this <laughs> analogy is supposed to help us see how an immaterial thing can causally interact with a material thing. That for all of Descartes' discussion about this matter, he never tells her how it works. He's just trying to tell her, don't make these mistakes. Okay, you're telling me not to conceive of m mind and body causation as being like body to body causation. That still doesn't help me understand how it works. How does m mind to body causation take place? And she has this famous, somewhat famous confession, where she says, "Look, it would be easier for me to conceive that m to conceive matter and extension to the soul than the capacity of moving a body and a being moved to an immaterial being." So in other words, feeling sort of the concern about how to square mind and body causation here, it's almost like Descartes is trying to tell her, you should just believe that there is some way an immaterial thing can causally influence a material thing, without it, the immaterial thing somehow being in any way material, or in any way like a material thing. Well, she says, you know, it'd be, if I had to really deal with this problem, you know, it would be easier for me to do is to think, well, maybe souls actually have some kind of extension to them. Maybe there is some kind of quality, you know, even that they might even be made out of matter. And this becomes a, a kind of issue in the modern era to think about. Is it possible for matter to exhibit consciousness? That thought. And really, in a way, this whole debate isn't gone from us today. I mean, we argue about, is it possible for a computer to have a thought? Can computers, you know, have beliefs and thoughts and feelings like you and I do? 
Some of you are probably inclined to say, no way, Jose, that's impossible. But others of you may think that, look, given enough time and sophistication, why couldn't we build a computer that is capable of these things? In a way, so Descartes would be on the no way Jose kind of crowd, because he would say, look, the very kind of stuff that matter is excludes consciousness. There's no way. It, you could build a computer or a robot that perfectly mimics human behavior, but it wouldn't, it wouldn't have human thought and feeling. What she is saying is I, at least something like, seems possible. I can, it doesn't seem like it's impossible for matter to have thought or consciousness to it. And if I have to fix this problem between mind and body causation, maybe that's the way to fix it, is to say maybe, it, maybe the mind, after all, is a kind of material or extended thing. This is where it gets really hairy now. This is where um, Descartes' response to her gets, for me, very confusing. So I want to take a look at this. We're on page 18, starting five lines from the top. So in response to what she has said about how maybe the mind could be an extended thing, um, he says, finally, the things that pertain to the union of the soul and the body are recognized only obscurely by the understanding alone or even by the understanding as aided by the imagination. Yet they are known very clearly by the senses. From that it comes about that those who never philosophize and who make use only of their senses do not doubt that the soul moves the body and the body acts upon the soul. But they consider the one and the other as a single thing. That is to say, they conceive their union. For to conceive the union existing between two things is to conceive them as one thing alone. The metaphysical thoughts that exercise the pure understanding serve to render the notion of the soul more familiar to us. And the study of mathematics, which principally exercises the imagination in considering figures and movements, accustoms us to, uh, from very distinct notions of body. And finally, it is by availing oneself only of life and ordinary conversations, and by abstaining from meditating and studying things that exercise the imagination, that one learns to conceive the union of the soul and the body. So what, what is he saying here? Let's take a stab. I know this is dense. Uh, what, do you, what are some of the things that you gather he's trying to tell her in this passage? Yeah. I think he said you can't use any of the other ways you have of understanding things to describe something I can't understand. That's good. So, you know, he's you can't rely on anything else. He does kind of suggest some people have, seem to have a way of understanding in maybe a confused way, but they make some that make sense to ordinary folks. Um, it's Tyler, right? Yeah. So what is for anybody, um, what are some of the things that he says ordinary people do um, that help them conceive or understand how this works? Yeah. They use the senses. Yeah, I mean, it's, this is one of the things that struck me as very, this is why I find this very confusing. Descartes, who says, don't trust your senses, and above all things, don't think of the soul like you would with the senses. You can't imagine what the soul looks like. You can't picture it. He says... You know who really understands and has no problem accepting mind and body interaction? It's common everyday people. You know what they do? They they think mind and body are you are they think of the mind as being like an extended thing or an embodied thing. Um so he says that you can recognize this obscurely by the understanding, but clearly and this is the thing that I think is just baffling. Clearly by the senses. What? 
Mr. Don't trust your senses, rely on the understanding first, is telling us to ignore the understanding. <coughs> And it's telling us that the understanding in this case, all of a sudden, is subject to fallibility and errors and leading us astray. I can't make heads or tails of that. And the other thing he says at the very end of this passage is he says, basically, don't do philosophy when it comes to this problem. Stop thinking. <laughs> and instead, immerse yourself in the everyday normal activities like common people do. Just go about your day do, and you'll be fine. What? <laughs> this makes no sense. Did they court um, the student You know, he did. He <laughs> gave his consent oh, okay. for his, for his <laughs> side to be published. Yeah. Um, so this is very perplexing. People don't know, I mean, what do you do with this answer? Some people, I mean, if you were really interested in getting into this, there's a lot of uh, research you could look at. One of the, the options is Descartes postulating, in addition to mind, in addition to bodies, a third kind of substance, a mind-body union substance. And that maybe what's happening is mind and body can't interact with each other. Maybe there's like a halfway mind-body substance in between the two. And that maybe the mind can interact with that thing which interacts with the body, and the body can interact with that third thing which interacts with the mind. It's like a go-between. Did he originally say that the mind and the body can't interact with each other, or did he say that they can't exist without each other? Like, was that specific? Like, did he specifically say they can't interact with each other? He would want to say, so to the first thing he'd say, they, he definitely thinks they can. Okay. The second issue, he would say that they, but it's also very clear that they could exist apart. Apart, right. Yeah? Didn't we learn that, though, in later meditations, he said you could somewhat trust the senses because God wouldn't fool you or something like that? That's so right. Is the, it's, it doesn't seem very contradictory to me. Well, it does, but that in, this, in this context of Descartes, because he says you can somewhat trust them later on. You can. What, stri what strikes me about the so odd about this is that here we are, we're thinking about metaphysical ideas. We're, we're thinking about even the essence of body and soul and their union. And instead of saying, meditate carefully on these ideas and think about them in a clear and distinct way, it's like he's saying, when you try to do that, it just gets obscure and confused. Ignore that and just rely on sensory experience. Maybe, I mean, here's a more, maybe here's a more charitable way to understand what he's saying, is that maybe this is something that is beyond our ability to understand. But it's something that we understand directly. It's something that we understand because we do it every moment. Like, anytime you say, arm, go up, you know, it does it. And you say, arm, go down. Now. You know, it happens. That um, mind and body interaction is something that we are aware of, not because we understand it or because we rationalize it, but it's because of something that we're directly like aware of it. It's something that we do. So maybe that's what he, here's maybe a more charitable interpretation. He's saying, don't try to understand it. Don't try to rationalize it. Just accept it because you do it. But this, may, this still doesn't really answer her question, does it? I mean, her question is trying to say, is raising a real puzzle about how can a non-extended thing causally interact with an extended thing? All knowledge that we have of extended things is that they causally interact by having some kind of contact or extension with another thing. So let's take a look at another thing that Descartes says here. So this is in response to that quote I had on the other slide. This is the very last paragraph on page 19. So since your highness notes it is easier to attribute matter and extension to the soul than to attribute to it when it has no matter, a capacity to move a body and be moved by one. I ask her, and now at this point, if I wasn't going to finish this, I would say, I bet he's going to say, I asked her to stop doing that because you shouldn't think of souls as extended things. What does he say? I ask her, 
to please freely attribute this matter and this extension to the soul. For that is nothing but to conceive it united to the body. <laughs> what is he doing? Um, he's saying, did, he, did I just read that he told her to conceive of the soul as being extended? And to conceive of the soul as having matter? I thought the whole point of his meditations, and, or the sixth meditation and his famous theory was to show us that, mind and that, that the mind or the soul is not a material thing and it has no extension. He just told her, go ahead and do that. Think of the... Un uh, maybe, and maybe there's a safer way to say this. So Maybe he's not saying think of the soul as being extended. Maybe he's just saying think of the union of them to be extended and composed of matter. But still, this is where we... Suppose he, he's right. And once again, one interpretation of this, certainly not a decisive one, it would still be a fringe interpretation, is that some people think he's postulating a third kind of substance. All right, so there's a thing that's not a body and it's not a soul. It's this go-between between, between bodies and souls. And it is material and it is uh, extended. If that's true, fine. Then how does the soul interact with that third thing? doesn't really help us to say, you say, well, there's a fourth thing that's half of that and then half soul. All right, then how does the soul interact with that fourth thing? Well, then there's a fifth thing. You know, you're not going to get to something that really makes sense of this. Um, does that make, do, do my frustrations make sense to you? Uh, are there other thoughts? Does anybody have any other way to interpret some of this or any other approach that comes to mind here as we're got, yeah. Maybe you just thought wouldn't be able to explain it to her like through a letter the way he would like want to or like to talk to her about it. So he just kind of like went along with what she thought and kind of let her think her own thing. Yeah. That might be true. I mean, there's limitations mm -hmm. to the length of a letter. Mm -hmm. He doesn't know. He doesn't know. Maybe, maybe he doesn't know how well she's acquainted with all of his writings mm -hmm. and things. So maybe he's just trying to make it work and just. Just like set, make her like you know calm down about it like. You're right. That's what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I actually see that. <laughs> yeah, well, exactly what I was going to say. Well, since your highness knows that it's easier to do it that way, just do it your way. Yeah. Because yeah. you can understand it. I see. So maybe he's just being very. I don't know if polite is the right word. And like women weren't, well. I mean, most women weren't well educated. So That's we right. Felt like there's no way she's gonna understand this, so I'm just gonna let her go with what she thinks. Yeah, he might have been uh, like undermining her uh, in intellect. That's possible, yeah. right? Um, you know, they do exchange pleasantries and all these. That's com some students complain about how it's like just way over the top, right? Um, although he did, I mean, it, I think that if he really thought that that lowly of her intellect, he wouldn't have replied in the first place, perhaps. He didn't have to write her back. Um, and, like I said, she's not a nobility really anymore. She's a deposed princess. So, you know, it's not, if he ignores her, there's really no political fallout here. And, and I would even add to the, that he's, he dedicated a book to her and wrote a second book because she asked him to. So, I think, my own view is I think that he does value her thought, he does respect her to some degree as a thinker because otherwise he wouldn't have done all that. Maybe that's not incompatible with what some what you're saying either, though. Especially maybe she did, um, like she's a woman thinker and for, you know, for her to think of all this is like a big deal. That's right. I mean, really, y you could argue that she is maybe the earliest sort of per like female philosopher. And she certainly didn't seek this out. She didn't want any of this to publish. Uh, the next lady that we're reading next week, you could say, was the very first woman philosopher who actually wrote philosophical work and got it published professionally and all that. So women getting into philosophy is a brand new kind of thing altogether. I did stress, though, that Descartes' method and the way that he operates is an egalitarian method, that he doesn't think 
at least the way that it's set up is that philosophy shouldn't be governed by idea by a prestigious background in education. He thinks everybody's got good reason. Remember from the discourse, good reason is the most well distributed thing in the world. Everybody's got it. The issue is just training yourself to use it well. And part of that training does not involve learning all the previous educations. It's really more about follow these basic steps. And none and that's just, you know, like start at the break your problem down into simple parts. Start with the easiest, work your way to the more complex, take careful notice of uh, each step along the way, take copious notes, that sort of thing. So in principle, he should think women are capable of doing philosophy. This would be also another research topic you could look into. There are sources that argue, is Descartes favorable to females doing philosophy, or is he antithetical to that? Other thoughts on what to do with this business here? Yeah, I yeah. feel like if he was thinking of like a third type of like connection substance, like he would have said that. Yeah. Because he doesn't seem like a person to really think <laughs> back like what he's thinking. So it seems kind of weird like if he respects her as like a fellow kind of thinker philosopher, that he didn't just go ahead and say it. So that, this is one of the reasons, of course, why people that, that's a minority view is that it seems like he really <laughs> meant that he would have said it. Mm -hmm. He he's not shy about telling us what he believes. Yeah. Like, if you, if you read a little bit more, it says, like, he has, you have to understand the principles of metaphysics because that gives you the knowledge of God and your soul. But he says, like, it would be it would be worse for you to, like, ignore, like, your senses and what you already believe than to, like, dwell on what you're already thinking, but just use what you already know to figure it out yourself, basically. So you see the, so how do you see that? Bring it up full circle here. So how does that help us with this? Um, well, it helps us because she is an understanding the connection between like the mind and body is being one and how they can interact with each other. And he's basically saying like to n don't dwell on seeing them as um, like two different things and actually seeing that they work, they exist within each other, and that they could be separate, they can exist without each other, but they are intertwined. Yeah, so, I mean, here's another way you could kind of approach this is to think that it's almost like a duck-rabbit kind of thing, if you're familiar with the, the picture of the duck-rabbit, right, where if you look at it one way, it looks like a duck, you look at it another way, it's a rabbit. Mind and body, you could look at it one way, where mind and body are like separate things. Or you could look at it another way, and they're like one thing. And maybe that's what he's trying to say, at least when it comes to humans, like what a human person is, there's a sense in which we are two things, and there's also a sense in which we are one thing one unified thing. And maybe what he's telling her is you got, you, you're got you doing a good job of understanding the one unified thing, you're not doing a good job of seeing the two separate things. But that still, I think, doesn't tell us how do they interact. <laughs> if they are two separate things, how does it work? Let's take a look at her response to this. Um, this is on page 21, as I clean up my book. Um, so in the very middle here, this is then in response to the things that Descartes was telling her about, maybe through the senses you can understand this idea. It says, I too find that the senses show me that the soul moves the body, but they fail to teach me any more than the understanding and the imagination, the manner in which she does it. And in regard to that, I think there are unknown properties in the soul that might suffice to reverse what your metaphysical meditations with such good reasons, persuaded me concerning inextension. And this doubt seems founded upon the rule you lay down there in speaking of the true and the false, namely, that all our errors occur from forming judgments about what we do not sufficiently perceive. Although extension is not necessary to thought, yet not being contradictory to it, it will be able to belong to some other function of the soul less essential to her. At least, that avoids the contradiction of the scholastics, namely that the entire soul is in the entire body and entirely in each of its parts. And she goes on to say a little more about that. So what she's saying here is that she still doesn't really buy um, what Descartes is saying about how mind and body interact with one another. So she says, look, Having an extent, adding extension to thought is not contradictory to it. 
At least I can imagine something having extension and having thought at the same time. It's not like they're mutually exclusive. So maybe while extension is not necessary for the soul, maybe it's sort of an, uh, an accidental or a contingent feature of the soul. Something that God designed so that the soul could interact with the body. So since extension is not a contradictory feature to thought, um, it may be an essential quality if you want the soul to causally interact with the body. So she basically remains unpersuaded by Descartes' reasons <coughs> and, and sticking to this idea that maybe a soul still has some kind of material or, or extended quality to it that allows it to have causal interaction with the body. And as far as we know, Descartes never replied to this letter. <laughs> Either out of frustration, <laughs> or because he, there's just no nothing more to be said here. I mean, he said every, he's unloaded all the ammunition, and if she's not persuaded, then that's all there is. So, this is what there is a lot of significance to this exchange, though. It's a very widely studied correspondence. Um, Elizabeth raises an important criticism about Descartes' mind-body dualism. How is it possible for an immaterial substance to causally interact with a material one? If you look at just about any book or any article that talks about Descartes' mind-body dualism, almost every single one of them cites this problem as the main problem with his theory. This is like the lasting legacy, one of the lasting legacies of Descartes' arguments about mind and body. I mean, this is what I think... It, he created a puzzle that philosophers have been dealing with for 500 years. One, it seems obvious that the mind and the body are different things. That consciousness is not the same thing as matter. We're like, yeah, we get that. Cool. But here's the other problem. Once you define consciousness and matter as completely separate things altogether, how do they work together? How, if you have nothing in common, how can you have causal interaction? Descartes struggled with this criticism not just in this correspondence, but throughout his whole life. Apparently, people would ask him about this repeatedly and constantly, and he would kind of snap back at them and say something to the effect of, look, I can only write so much philosophy solving so many problems in my lifetime. You know, I'm sorry I can't answer all of your questions. <coughs> What some of Descartes' followers decided to do, um, and here are a number of, of important people, uh, Laforge, Cordemoy, uh, Gulnick, I don't know, this guy, last guy is Dutch, I don't know how to say that. Um, but most importantly, Nicholas Malebranche, who um, is a big deal, they all adopted a form uh, of, of explaining this called occasionalism. Occasionalism is the idea that God is the one and only cause in the universe. So nothing can cause anything else to happen. Only God has that power. Everything else that takes place are merely what they call occasions, or maybe we could call them indicators, for when God should jump in and cause things to happen. So here's how they would fix the problem of mind-body interaction. And th these... These fellows are in the first generation of, of Cartesians after Descartes passes away. And they said, let's say I'm walking carelessly and I accidentally hit my leg on the desk. Ow! Okay. Nerves send signals up my spinal cord to my brain that in turn cause my soul, we would say, to feel pain. Well, how does the brain cause the soul to feel pain? This is how. When those neurons fire in my brain, God steps in and causes pain to take place in my mind. And then if I react and say, well, since I'm feeling pain, I want to grab my leg, so I choose to, like, look down and to grab my leg where it hurts, what God does there is then, in response to my mind doing that, he causally makes my body do that response. So... Mind and body don't actually interact with one another. What happens is that whenever the mind needs to do something with the body, God jumps in the gap and causes and does and bridges that. 
and makes the body do what the mind tells it, what the mind was going to tell it to do. And vice versa, when something happens in the body that is going to cause something to take place in the mind, God jumps in that gap and causes that to t causes the right thing to take place in the mind. Um, so this became such a big deal that people based some of Descartes' own followers came to believe the only way you could fix this problem is by God performing a miracle each and every single time mind and body interact are supposed to interact with one another. Seems like a pretty radical uh, fix, don't you think? Leibniz has his own wonderful way of dealing with this, which we're, we're going to look at later today. Um, and I think this is my last slide, so let me pause and just see. Are there any questions about this problem of mind-body interaction and uh, maybe any questions you have about occasionalism? Yeah? Did they come up with occasionalism like, based on this problem, or is that so? There, there is a pre-existing history of occasionalism prior to this. Um, it was actually pretty prominent in Islamic philosophy um, in the like the seven eight hundred seven eight nine hundreds, because and you could get persuaded of this for for these reasons as well. Jonathan Edwards, a uh, great American philosopher and theologian, was a an occasionalist. Why? For the same reason as the Muslims, which is that to say anything else can cause anything else robs God of His omnipotence and His sovereignty. So if God is truly omnipotent, if He's truly all powerful then he really is the only thing that can cause anything else to take place. And on, just as a teaser, for Jonathan Edwards' view, remember, you, you all know who Jonathan Edwards is. You may have read, you know, Sinners in the Hands yeah, of an Angry God, yeah, that dude. Like pissed off uh, preacher, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, also, I mean, like, president of Yale, you know, founder of Yale, I mean, a great mind, too, but uh, he thinks that every discrete moment of time, God is constantly creating the world, that what's taking place, there, there is no smooth continuity of reality, that each moment the world is being destroyed and recreated, destroyed and recreated, and it's just like slides on a movie in that if it's done fast enough and quick enough, it feels like it's just one smooth, continuous reality. But this was, according to Edwards, an inevitable consequence of God being sovereign and having um, omnipotence. If we had the ability to govern our own lives and to cause things to happen, that takes away from God. Pretty exciting stuff, I know. So, he doesn't believe in free will? <clears throat> well, that's an interesting question. There's, we're going to talk a little bit, not exactly about Edwards, of course, but a similar kind of question with Leibniz. But he doesn't think of free will the way you and I might think about free will. Close is occasionalism to the uh, Calvinism idea. Well, it's not necessarily intertwined, but of course Edwards was like a major Calvinist. Like he's a better Calvinist than Calvin was. Um, it certainly fits well with it for the, for those reasons. But certain, I wouldn't I wouldn't want to argue that if you are a Calvinist, you must be an occasionalist. Okay. They're just kind of a nice fit. And I think that if you have certain views about like free will that are going the other direction, I think it's very hard to make that work. <laughs> Alright, let's go ahead and take a quick break. And you need to honor the quick side of the break if we want to keep having breaks. So let's try to be back when it says 7.40 on the clock, and I want to pick up then with Leibniz, and hopefully we can knock out the rest of our reading then. Thank you.